Okay, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us uh, for this BCVS uh, video session. I'm pleased to be here with Dr. Eduardo Marban, who's from the Cedar sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles, California. He gave a fantastic talk on COVID-19 and the heart, so we want to share some of that with you. So Dr. Marman, if you can give us an overview of the topic that you presented, that would be great to catch us all. Yeah, you know, one of the uh, leading uh, organs that's implicated in um, COVID infection is the heart. Uh, although we think of the lung being the primary target, uh, uh, it is, of course, there are very frequent, at least biomarker elevations related to uh, heart disease. And uh, a number of complications of the disease uh, can be uh, devastating and are clearly cardiac in nature. Yeah, that's really interesting that that uh, you've seen we've seen a lot of troponin elevation. Um, is does and actually after SARS-CoV the the um, outbreak in two thousand three or so, there was a lot of research that was done on the pulmonary complications, but maybe less attention to cardiac complications. So it's interesting that we're seeing that now. Um, and is that troponin elevation related to myocarditis or viral infection or cytokine storm? Yeah, probably um, all the above to some degree, but the best uh, evidence is that uh, clinical myocarditis, um, Myocarditis that suffices to create cardiac dysfunction and goes on to merit uh, an endomyocardial biopsy um, for verification of the diagnosis is pretty rare. It's uh, in the form of probably a handful of case reports. I'm aware of uh, five or six worldwide uh, in which there's actually documented tissue documented myocarditis, um, at least during the course of the illness. In autopsy series, um, there's been some documentation of mild lymphocytic uh, infiltration in the heart in a number of patients who were not suspected to have myocarditis. So it may be a generalized uh, phenomenon. Uh, the actual incidence of um, direct infection of cardiomyocytes is not that well known. It's been shown in um, cardiomyocytes created from IPS cells human cardiomyocytes created from IPS cells that uh, SARS-CoV-2 can directly infect cardiomyocytes, but there's a paucity of evidence for that uh, in the literature. A few case reports with electron micrographs that show viral particles within the heart, but it's not really clear whether those viral particles are in endothelial cells or cardiomyocytes or uh, fibroblasts. That's a great point because ACE2, the receptor for the spike protein, is probably is is I think uh, well expressed in cardiomyocytes and probably in some endothelial cells. But Tempris two, which is another um, enzyme needed for entry, is I believe lowly expressed in the heart. So I, mean, I, I don't know if you have any thoughts about that or the furin um, site that is somewhat unique to the CoV two virus. Well, uh, certainly the uh, tissues that we associate with initial uh, disease are very richly um, expressing the receptors to which you alluded. Um, nasal goblet cells are particularly rich in ACE2 and, and um, the TMP, um, TMMP modifying protein. So um, I take your point, uh, I'm not sure in an in vivo infection, how likely when there's that much competition for receptors and virus, how likely direct cardiomyocyte infiltration would be. My suspicion is that it's quite rare uh, in the mm -hmm. clinical setting and that we're seeing um, these fairly common biomarker elevations. It's said that up to 25% uh, or so of hospitalized patients with COVID have elevations of troponin and I. The same class of patients tends to have elevations in other uh, inflammatory biomarkers that are generically inflammatory, CRP, ferritin, uh, and so on. So whether it's a fellow traveler that's just an indication of systemic inflammation or telling us something specific about heart disease is still remains to be seen. 
is cardiac involvement a later phenomenon or have we been seeing it you know that uh with uh, early presentations as well you know there are these anecdotal reports on social media etc about about people getting starting to get better with their pulmonary uh, issues and then all of a sudden crashing and burning and and having cardiac arrest or you know, bad cardiac um, uh, manifestations. Well, what we know about that so far, Mina, is that uh, on admission, the laboratory um, abnormalities um, predict the outcome. So if there is a troponin elevation at uh, admission, that is a that is a that is a harbinger for high mortality and for complications. However, that troponin in patients who already have it elevated, who do not go on to survive, keeps rising and rising and rising. Whereas mm -hmm. in patients who do survive, uh, it falls along with the other inflammatory biomarkers. I think what you're talking about. Um, is a really interesting phenomenon, which is that we think we're out of the woods with the acute illness. And there are at least a few cases of patients that seem to suffer from cardiac arrest or collapse. Uh, in some cases, right before they're uh, discharged, in at least one case that's been reported, um, the patient was discharged and then had a uh, devastating uh, cardiac arrest. Um, so, um, how frequently this happens and whether there's some kind of secondary autoimmune phenomenon that's as yet poorly characterized um, is not that clear. But what we know about the lifetime of infec infectious particles within the body um, doesn't make me think that it's very likely that we're seeing another viremia, another uh, wave of reinfection that's behind those uh, secondary events. Right. Do we know anything yet about um, later sequelae of cardiac involvement? Well, you alluded to the uh, SARS um, epidemic of 2002 and 2003. And there, um, long-term survivors, and there's only, I think, uh, 1,800 or so in that category, um, many of whom have since died of natural causes. Uh, but the long-term, meaning years, complications there include hyperlipidemia and hypertension uh, and a number of um, uh, other cardiac-related uh, events, I think there's glucose intolerance, that are overrepresented relative to the otherwise uh, demographic risks of that population. Obviously, it's not a controlled experiment, but you can kind of do a case control series and argue that those complications are overrepresented. It's way too early to see those complications in COVID. I mean, the first uh, cases were described in December in Wuhan, and we didn't really see it much in the Western world until um, you know, until February or March. Uh, but um, I would suspect that um, we'll be seeing a lot of that as time goes on. Certainly, in talking to patients who are survivors, um, several of whom are physicians in my experience, they describe lingering uh, fatigue, shortness of breath, uh, they just don't feel right. And, um, and certainly one could imagine that there are uh, fibrotic consequences and maybe uh, long-term consequences of these thrombotic events that are you know, frequently described in, in the disease. Are, they, are younger people susceptible to the cardiac complications? Because of their long-term sequelae, we're seeing more and more young people um, with the infection, and this could become a big problem for them as well. Well, you know, younger people in general uh, um, have a higher frequency of asymptomatic illness, and uh, when they do get sick, tend to have milder disease. Uh, but uh, correcting for that, um, that is adjusting for severity of illness, they get just as much cardiac complications as, um, as older patients, with the exception that if a patient has a pre-existing heart condition, uh, atherosclerosis or heart failure, of course, they have a disproportionate uh, toll. But there's no indication per se that youth is protective against the cardiac complications. It's just that it's generally protective against the illness. Mm -hmm. well, that's a great point. And then, you know, we're also hearing more and more about potential brain um, uh, 
involvement and uh, you know there have been some thoughts that perhaps that could uh, uh, or involvement of the brainstem as well could be involved with some of these later um, you know, catastrophic events and that would affect the heart so I don't know if that uh, their brain heart connections there well there's certainly a brain heart connection in um, or in a very general sense in Takotsubo cardiomyopathy and we're seeing a lot of reports now of um, an increased uh, incidence of uh, so-called broken heart syndrome, yes. which seems to be a neurogenic form of short-term stunning, basically. And um, in terms of the cerebral complications per se, uh, I wonder how many of those are reflective of the vascular disease, because at least at autopsy, there's microthrombi everywhere. Uh, it's not a, um, you know, it's not a disease that is particularly kind on any organ. Um, it's just that, um, you know, we see it more overtly in the lung and in the heart and typically than we do in other systems. Mm. So we're seeing, you're seeing microthrombi in the heart as well and, and infarction. Uh, well, in, uh, in autopsy series, microthrombi have now been described uh, within the smaller uh, epicardial coronary arteries. But um, one of the interesting paradoxes of the uh, illness is that the entire deck seems to be stacked against you in terms of an acute coronary syndrome. There's uh, hyperinflammation. Uh, there's uh, this tendency towards uh, thrombotic uh, events that's even been described as, uh, as DIC in some cases. Um, there's uh, systemic high demand. There's hypoxia. There's everything in the cookbook that you could possibly put together to promote acute coronary syndromes. And yet, acute coronary syndromes are rare in COVID. Mm -hmm. They're, relative to the um, vast frequencies, let's say 25% of biomarker elevations in hospitalized patients with COVID, we see a vanishingly small number of acute coronary syndromes. It's not to minimize the incidence of acute coronary syndromes. It's just that I think there's something biologically interesting in the fact that every risk factor that we know uh, pathophysiologically might contribute to an acute coronary syndrome is ramped up in COVID, and yet we don't see it in every patient. It's not that common. Mm -hmm. When you do see it, and they go to the cath lab and need an intervention, um, are there any is there anything particularly special about handling or what we should be doing uh, in the cath lab? I have heard that some of them are so seem so prone to thrombosis that it's difficult uh, with even you know thrombosis during procedure. Well, the, the whole um, question of how to manage the prothrombotic tendency and when and whether to use uh, not just anticoagulation, but even thrombolytic therapy is, uh, I, I would best characterize it as an active topic of discussion for the reasons uh, that you queued up. Um, but um, one thing that's notable in the case, the very small case series that have been described uh, from collective experience in, among New York uh, hospitals is that uh, the cath lab uh, is activated not infrequently for uh, clean coronary. So there's mm -hmm. something about these patients that, you know, mm -hmm. presents chest pain and ST elevations, some, sometimes uh, seemingly segmental. Uh, and then you go to the cath lab and they're, um, and they're clean. And so one thing that's been advocated from first principles, not because it's been subjected to uh, an actual trial, but one uh, bit of evidence to help in that quandary, whether to activate the team and put a bunch of people at high risk for BPD and uh, infection is uh, to do an echocardiogram acutely. And if there's segmental wall motion abnormality or global dysfunction, yeah, take them to the um, cath lab, but otherwise, uh, you know, watchful waiting may actually not be the worst thing. All right, it seems that many, uh, many uh, centers may include, you know, uh, point of care type echoes as well on, on admission. Um, it does, is that something we should be doing? Is there any um, screening or, or routine screening that you think we should do on admission on everybody coming in or in, admitted or, or to the ICU? 
I think routine um, functional monitoring of uh, hospitalized patients um, is going to be low yield. Uh, we just don't see that many um, that many clinical events. Mm -hmm. But I think having the ability to do echoes in patients who um, are hypotensive, who have uh, echocardiogra electrocardiographic abnormalities, um, is a um, you know, it's a good thing. Uh, we've already talked about Takotsubo. We've talked about myocarditis. Uh, we've talked about acute coronary syndromes, and obviously. Uh, because those are all recoverable, we would want to do everything we can to um, either rule them in or rule them out. And uh, as of now, at least, the diagnostic criteria for each of those things, uh, Takotsubo, acute coronary syndrome, and um, myocarditis haven't changed. It's, so we need to do whatever we do clinically to ascertain and manage those, uh, those syndromes. And then arrhythmias, you know, <laughs> electrophysiologists. So it's always interesting to see, you know, the percentage, uh, look at papers to see what kind of arrhythmias they're getting. Uh, hard to know if it's all secondary though. Uh, well, so this is an area that um, we've uh, studied and I discussed in the talk. Um, and it's cons what's consistent with our findings are a few reports from um, uh, New York and elsewhere which is that, yes, sinus tachycardia is, is really common. In hospitalized patients, you know, 30, 40% have sinus tachycardia. But when you look at really the kinds of things you're interested in, um, really severe SVT or VT or BFib or asystole, it doesn't happen. I mean, it's incredibly rare, which is, again, the, um, the reason that it's again consistent with this paradox that we were talking about for acute coronary syndrome. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for answering all those questions and discussing COVID-19 in the heart, uh, Dr. Mar Marban. I'm so glad that, that many people will have access to this video, hopefully. Um, it was very informative. You're welcome. Take care.